All right, so we're back at Cracks in Postmodernity. Today we have Stella Tzandekidu, who is a campaigner, political commentator, writer, currently based in the UK. Stella, thank you for coming on. Thank you, Stephen. You pronounced my last name so well. Well, we would okay. hope so. Seven years of Greek school, I hope they're put to good use. Yeah. So, uh, so no, I mean, we have to say you're you're from Greece, you're from Thessaloniki, and you've been in the UK for how many years now? So I was born and raised in Thessaloniki, and I came uh, to London for university. Okay. And I've been there, I've been here for 12 years now, so a very long time. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. So I, I was telling you, I found your work through, you did a guest post on Mary Harrington Substack. Mm -hmm. Very interesting post I want to get into. But before that, for people who haven't already seen your work, tell us a little bit about your background, what your what your focus is now to let, let people know. You know. So my background is in politics. I studied law at university in London, and then I went straight into politics mm -hmm. after that. I was a field organizer on the first Bernie Sanders campaign in 2016. And then I came back to the UK where I worked in parliament as a speechwriter for Labour Party politicians um, who were at the time in the opposition and still are, although we may be having a change of government come October, November, December, when we have the next general elections. Since then, I have been working for charities. So I, I lobby for them. I try to convince politicians, the government to do the things that the charities I work for believe we should do. Right now, I'm head of policy for a criminal justice charity. Uh, at the same time, I'm a political commentator. I, I go on TV regularly and radio and I give my opinions uh, on whatever is going on. We had local elections on uh, Thursday night. Um, so, yeah, since Thursday, I have been um, on, on radio and TV multiple times, just, just giving my uh, hot takes. <laughs> I hate that phrase, but I guess that is what we, well, that is what we do. Uh, I jokingly refer to myself as a media grifter, and generally people who do what I do, you know, political commentating, I refer to them as media grifters because we're not journalists. Um, we don't go out and find new stories. We just go on the media and um, give our opinions. Mm -hmm. um, and I also write. I have a Substack. Yes. I, it, it is it is an, an art project more than anything else. I do some political com commentary as well there, and I, I wanted to write more about politics, but um, very naturally I just write more personal essays just because that's what I enjoy and that is what I think people connect more with. I could write political analysis like the stuff that I do on TV and radio or what I do for my job, but I think that there are people who do this better than than me, and I think there is enough you know political analysis out there. Um, so I try to be as personal as possible in my writing and to connect as much as possible with the mm -hmm. people who uh, go on Substack to read my stuff. Yeah. And as you say in, you know, your kind of introductory posts on Substack, you say that you're a moderate, but that the way you communicate yourself is very bold. And I think it's, for me, it's refreshing because I think in the media scape, like I was saying before, People are very caught up with saying the right thing, but to the point that they lose their personality, they lose their their sense of charisma. So seeing someone who, yeah, like wants to be out there, wants to be, you know, uh, wants to have that kind of fiery personality, like that's uh, it's a breath of fresh air. So I mean, why why is this important to you though? Like, why do you brand yourself as a moderate but someone who's bold and out there? Yeah. So in a sense, it's not really a choice. It's just about. So I am who I am, right? I am a Greek yeah. person who has a very, I have a very strong personality and uh, even for Greek standards, I'm quite bold in the way that I communicate. I have very strong feelings and I communicate those and I always had very, very strong opinions. I have been very, very political since I was young, just on my own. My, my parents were not particularly political. And when I came to the UK and I, 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 I wanted to work in politics, British politics can be, people in British politics are extremely cautious. They're extremely cautious yeah. about their careers, about their image, about the way that they speak. And so when I first tried to put my foot in the door and start working in parliament, I thought I need to, I need to be extremely careful. I need to have, you know, a very professional image and I need to be, to make sure I don't tweet anything. That's the wrong thing to say. I need to make sure that my Instagram is clean and all of these things. And 
I remember I ran for student council in university yeah. and the people who were running with me, that was the, the thing we decided uh, we were running as a slate. And very early on, we're like, right, we're going to remove all the photos of us drinking alcohol from our <laughs> social media. And we are going to, to dress in a casual but relaxed way. And we're going, and there was all of this spin, you know, that we were trying to do. And we were trying to create this image of, okay, what would the average university voter want to, to, to who, who would they want to vote for? And the more I stayed in the game, the more I stayed in politics, the more I worked in politics, the more I realized that when I was trying to go down that, that road, I wasn't being as effective. I was, just, I was just not that good at it. Like, for example, if I wanted to do, you know, something like what Matthew Iglesias does, right? Yeah. Which is, he's an extremely careful journalist who puts tons of research, tons of attention to detail and tries to offer a, as balanced a view, a view as possible. Yeah. This is not my talent. I could not, I would not be able to do that. And if I was trying to do that right now and I was trying to write articles like that, then uh, the result would be both super bo boring and not very useful to anyone. Yeah. Because, you know, the thing with someone like Matthew Iglesias is that he may be, uh, you know, it, it is in the title of his Substack, slow, boring. He, his his stuff may be a yeah. bit slow and boring, but they're extremely, extremely useful. I couldn't do that. So I thought, I rather than trying to work against my own nature, I need to just do the thing that I can do. And then if people respond to it, then that's good. If not, then that's, you know. And uh, now we are at a place where the party that I've, been a member of throughout my time here and that I worked for may end up in government. And a lot of people like me are extremely careful about the way they express themselves online. They have, they hold a very low profile because they, they are very, very worried about saying the wrong thing or putting across the wrong image, especially women my age. I see that a lot with women my age. And I think that that ends up, you, you just end up not convincing anyone, not attracting anyone's interest. I feel like everyone has ADHD these days, or if they don't, you know, their attention is completely fragmented from, from social media, from smartphones, from whatever it is. Nobody really has the attention span to uh, uh, sit down and read something that does that they don't enjoy because everything has become entertainment. But once I started writing more personally, I realized that uh, people are really, really starving for someone who shares yeah. their, their experience um, unflinchingly, basically, and especially like things that people think are quite shameful, uh, which I don't, I no longer feel like are particularly shameful. Like, you know, admitting, for example, um, to the fact that I was bullied in high school or admitting to things that I don't like about my personal life or my dating life or whatever. Yeah. And I found people really responding to that. Like I started having out of the blue, I just started having so many people commenting on my posts, people sending me letters to my work, telling me how much my writing means to them. And that's where I am now. And you also say though that you feel this need to speak for people who are like, quote unquote, lower on the totem pole. Um, and this ties into what you're saying now about giving voice to things that some people would think are inappropriate things you're not supposed to talk about. So like, what does that mean to you that you feel like you need to give voice to, to certain kinds of people? Yeah, so I think that a lot of people, everyone has status anxiety and myself included. And I think that for that reason, a lot of people are afraid to say uh, things like, you know, I got rejected. I'm really mm -hmm. tired of dating yes. because I get rejected all the time and I really want a relationship. I really crave human connection and human company and I really struggle. And instead of, you know, just going out and say that, they find some other cope. Like they say, oh, I don't, I don't want that actually. I don't want a relationship or... Uh, you know, all men, all men are all men are scam. So why would I want to date them? Or all women are hoes, or whatever. They will have some yeah. hope about uh, not wanting a relationship. And for me, I feel because I do have a slightly narcissistic ego where I really like myself, I really value myself, even when I'm not doing particularly well at something. I'm still like I have a healthy, uh, I, I hold a healthy sense of value for my own yeah. self. Um, and I, for that reason, I feel like I can say some more awkward things that other people may not be able to tolerate hearing themselves say. I see that in politics as well. You know, I started doing media, like I started going on TV in the summer and 
straight away I was like, oh my God, this is horrible. I, I feel so, I feel so mm. subconscious seeing yeah. myself speak. And like, I have to give opinions on things that I know nothing about. And I'm being, you know, I'm being asked to like comment on, I don't know, uh, quantitative easing or whatever, things that there is no reason why someone like me should be giving analysis on. Uh, and there is this game on, on people who want to be in public life where you have to constantly prepare, pretend like you know everything. Mm-hmm. And for me, I'm, I feel like, okay, I'm, I feel good enough with myself to admit that I'm doing something I'm not equipped to be doing as well as I would like yeah. to. Yeah, no, it's it's definitely interesting because I feel like a lot of the problem that I keep seeing is that, okay, we all have some inadequacy. Like, sure, some people are more successful than others, but we're all insecure in some way. And so much of the problem is like we've become accustomed to, like you said, finding some cope, projecting this insecurity through some kind of like facade or as just being blunt about say hey like I feel like shit because I got rejected or like I am jealous of these people because I'm not doing it like it's refreshing and like I don't know my my own way of dealing with it is like through self-deprecation like I think that that's like there's a huge need for people with the self-deprecating sense of humor because one like we need to have some humility like we need to stop acting like you said like we know everything we have everything figured out but also like we become so serious that we forget how to laugh like we need some entertainment otherwise we get so bored and like stuffy you know so yeah i see yeah i see this so much now in the uk with um Mm -hmm. The Labour Party that I'm a member of and all of the people my age who are very clearly have ambition to work for the party once we are in government mm-hmm. and they they are so terrified of showing vulnerability and politicians as well you see this in politicians all the time they're so terrified of doing of being vulnerable of 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 anyone seeing them as unserious or making fun of them and then you have someone like donald trump in the u.s or boris johnson in the uk and they come like a a complete bulldoze over all of these you know um standards that that we would that we think we need to hold ourselves uh, uh to and they and people love them for it People yeah. forgive them for for murder, basically. Yeah, no, I mean that's that. I think is like when they talk about Trump derangement syndrome. Like, sure, you can critique him on a political level, but there is something genius about his comedic aesthetic sensibility. That again, like this is, I think, similarly in the U.S. and in the U.K. Like, we have this very moralistic puritanical mentality. We must say the right thing, but to have someone who's just like a clown, you know. I mean, again, like, I, I just think we need to laugh. Like, we need to poke a little bit of fun. So the thing that I was saying in one of my essays called You're Probably Not Obama mm-hmm. is a lot of people will keep a very tight image of themselves and yeah. they will never try anything publicly because they will be really scared of falling. Yeah. And in their minds, they think, what if one day, you know, I become Obama? What if one day I become the, I want to become the president of the United States? What if one day, and that goal can be whatever, you know, this is just, like being president of the US is, I guess, extremely difficult, but like anything. One day I may want to become a politician. One day I may become a very famous writer. And then and then people will see the first essay as I, I published on Substack. And it was so bad. And it was full of grammar mistakes. And people will not take me seriously. And it will come back to haunt me. So they never start writing. They never start publishing their work. They never speak out about anything in case, you know, the wind changes and, and they find themselves in a difficult position. And eventually what you have is you're going to waste your whole life waiting to become Obama, but you will never become Obama because yeah. it is only a tiny minority of the population who are going to achieve these heights. And then, you know, you have to remember that Trump also became president. Trump, yeah. despite all of his background and despite all of, you know, the the, the horrible way in which he, he, he engaged in public life in, 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 in many, many ways, people forgave him because they felt like he was being more authentic to himself. And also there is this other thing that this writer called Sasa, I can't remember his last name, but he talks about the mode of, um, what is it called? So basically what he says is when you start, when you start in something, when mm-hmm. you first endeavor into a new field, there is a lot of forgiveness that's uh, awarded to you because you are new Mm -hmm. and you're still uh, taking your first baby steps so people will want to mentor you people will want to give you advice people will be forgiving so if you are a new writer for example and you post your first sub stack nobody's going to come and say oh this would never get the nobel prize nobody's going to say anything like that everyone will be very encouraging Mm -hmm. and you need to really uh, feel comfortable in that first stage and you know embrace it yeah 
yeah no i think that's again like having that sense of um i guess that sense of humility is what kind of keeps us grounded and like sane ultimately because then when we again like you're saying when we think we have it all figured out we know everything like that's when we get screwed over you know um but i mean i do want to get into the kind of cultural dynamic here because you know when you're saying like you as a greek woman in the uk clearly the mode of the modes of communication are very different in the north northern europe versus the south and you know you mentioned in your subsec that camille Paglia is someone who influences you this is something she always wrote about, like being an Italian American in the mostly Anglo Saxon dominated academic circles in the US. Like her style of expressing herself was totally unwelcome. And she's also said that, like others from different cultures, like oh, Jews, Blacks, Hispanics, like there's a way of talking that's very different from the Anglo sensibility. And when you're saying, I don't know, like when you're describing your experience there, like it makes me think of like my Yaya, who's from Greece, comes to this country her way of uh, i don't know her sense of what was appropriate was completely different from what her neighbors thought so, like she was completely politically incorrect said things that like you know today you get crucified for saying but she didn't, you know she didn't mean anything by it it's just i think like in southern europe we tend to be a little bit more blunt to the point we don't try to dress it up in this like respectable framing um so i don't know i mean say, can you say a little bit more though about like the culture the difference between the cultural dynamics between when you're in greece versus being in the uk yeah, so it's exactly that. Um, so you know, sometimes during during the co during COVID during the lockdown, mm -hmm. when uh, my flatmate who was Greek, uh, he would take his work meetings in in the house because mm -hmm. it was the lockdown, and I used to I remember listening on li listening to him taking his work meetings in English yeah. and thinking, oh, he probably sounds really aggressive and and rude mm -hmm. to his colleagues. Yeah. But in Greek, he sounds perfectly fine. Yeah. And that's something that I had an issue, and I still have an issue with. People like would just find me aggressive. People would very often say, oh my God, is he drunk? Like, I'm usually <laughs> sober, by the way. Like, I rarely drink. Um, and it's it's the same when, you know, I, I will go on I will go on live TV and, uh, and people will take a really great issue with the way I speak. But then if you go to Greece, if you watch TV in Greece, this yeah. is exactly how we communicate. Mm -hmm. And there is something about, there is a certain level of passive aggressiveness Yes, uh, that is uh, considered not just appropriate but uh, skillful, socially skillful, yes. when Absolutely. used in 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 the UK and in the US. And there are certain things that um, for British people, a, a certain way of speaking will be seen as polite. But if you go back to Greece, it will be seen as patronizing. For example, if you don't tell someone how you are really feeling about something, and you just tell them, "Yes, that's nice, thank you, whatever," when when in fact you are criticizing them then that would be considered extremely patronizing and rude yeah. from the Greek perspective because you are not honoring the other person with sharing how you actually feel about something. And I think with politics, this has, I think part of the culture war stems in that, in that mm -hmm. people have been suppressing what they have been really thinking about a lot of issues because they wanted to keep the high social status of, oh, I think of, you know, the, whatever the most politically correct thing was. Yeah. But eventually they just couldn't, they just couldn't keep, keep it all under wraps yeah no and i mean the the politically correct issue like i have heard greeks say some things that again like will get you in huge trouble in the u.s or in the uk and it's what i have come to see under time over time is that so like if we take for example the things that my grandmother would say having to do with race like she would say things that are extremely like just out of question like you can't say anymore and it wasn't coming from like a deeply racist sentiment. It wasn't coming from disdain for people from a different mm. background. It's more like her immediate reaction to recognizing certain differences between different cultures. And I feel like, and especially in, mo in most Southern European cultures, it's normal to just have like your immediate instinctive reaction to something, which may not be prim and proper, yeah. but it's honest. And then, you know, as you continue the conversation, you see it's not coming from true hatred or like some kind of evil sentiment but it's like there's a little more uh we're a little bit more generous with like we're more patient with people's humanity is what i want to say like we understand that our immediate reaction is not always going to be the proper thing to say but uh, there's we give space to that you know yeah and oh and and there is also there is the comfort of uh having a confrontation with someone and mm -hmm. having an argument and having 
as you say, space for very intense feelings. I think this is something that Anglo-Saxons feel very uncomfortable with. They feel really, really uncomfortable. Whenever there are intense feelings, they take them extremely seriously and they get very, very scared. Whereas in, in, in more Mediterranean cultures, we are okay with people getting angry with us. We don't think that just because someone is angry, that means the break, the, the, the falling yeah. apart of the relationship. Like you can argue with your colleagues and come back the next day and you have forgotten about it and it's fine. Yeah, no, I mean, I think Anglos tend to be more conflict diverse. Like let's let's avoid conflict at all costs, even if that means we have to hide what we really feel. Um, but I'm curious, like when you go back to Greece, are there things that you notice about the culture that you wouldn't have picked up on if you'd lived in Greece your entire life? Um, definitely. Like uh, what I said, like the, the space that we give for big feelings and, you know, big mm -hmm. gestures is definitely something that I have, I have felt very, very, um, intensely. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I still find, you know, there is a lot, I still find, you know, that in terms of sexism, racism, homophobia, all of that, there is a lot of the, more of that in Greece. Yeah. Political correctness still really, really not a thing uh, in any in any sense. Really? And, you know, you know like, in like then, what about in like academic circles? Like, is there a sense that like you have? There is more, there is more and it's yeah. they're starting now and there are some things, you know, like the um, the trans debate is starting to mm -hmm. happen in Greece now, very, very shyly and from obviously very specific groups of people. Yeah. Uh, and I am I am very worried because what they what they do with both feminist issues and with LGBTQ issues and with racism and all of that is rather than look at Greece and what Greece needs and what political ideology needs to come out of Greece, they're looking at what's going on in the US yeah. and they're trying to copy exactly the same. Yeah. And that worries me because you cannot copy the same language, the same arguments. And, and all of that, of course, happens because of social media, right? You right. will get some people who are social media savvy and they will, be, uh, they will create social media accounts and groups and they will go and they will look at the memes in the US and the infographics in the US. They will translate them in Greek and then they will start sharing them. Um, and I think it is very seductive to do that if you speak yeah. English, because it does mean that you will have loads of comments straight away, con loads of content, sorry, mm -hmm. straight away. And you could very easily make a name out of yourself as an activist in Greece. But I think that it's this is just very very messy because it means that one you are uh, you are um, taking problems which are, are are very different. You're applying very different you know a very different lens, mm -hmm. and two we are just you know you're not learning the lessons from these other countries. I mean I don't think that anyone could argue that the way that we uh, the way that the trans uh, movement was fought over the last few years was a particularly productive way, and I think that you know the, the results have been quite controversial. Yeah, yeah. Um, the other thing I'm wondering is what you notice about the differences between attitudes towards work, because like this, this for me has always been a big issue. Because again, I told you, my grandmother is from an island; she's from Chios. Like the way the the lifestyle there is very different coming to the U.S., especially being you know in the New York metropolitan area, where you know you really define yourself by work. You define yourself by the amount of I don't know, like material uh, wealth you accumulate. Whereas in the islands, it's like, I don't know, you just, you live, you you work because you have so to. So the islands are definitely very different from the rest of the mainland Greece. And most people, you know, live in the mainland Greece, especially Athens and Thessaloniki. And I think that what you will have seen, what is different from your grandmother's generation and my parents' generation. So my parents, you know, they would work and they would develop their businesses until they had enough money to feed their families and that's it. And okay. the rest of the time they focused it on their family and all of that. But I don't think that my generation is like that because of the financial crisis and because I think my generation is a lot more insecure. They don't have the worker protections that people in the US and the UK have. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of them are just, you know, very used to working for extremely low wages with, you know, no set hours, yeah. no actual protections. Um, so for a lot of them, the, the culture is more like just be happy for whatever you are given. Um, yeah. It's definitely not as, we are definitely not yet as career focused because culturally, because there simply isn't, the, the opportunities aren't there. It's still, career is a lot more still about making money and surviving rather than I am this, uh, you know, person. Yeah. 
Yeah. But uh, even when I was growing up, there was definitely starting, people were definitely already starting to get more status out of their work. Like, mm -hmm. for example, we have this joke in Greece that everyone wants to study business management in Greece because everyone wants to manage a business. Yeah. Everyone wants to be a manager. And we're like, okay, who's going to be the worker? <laughs> if everyone is a manager, yeah. who is going to be the, you know, the employee? Interesting. But, okay, so but you're saying that, like, in the big cities like Athens and Thessaloniki, like, there is more of a, uh, I'd say people have more of a work ethic than in the islands. Is that safe to say? Definitely. I mean, people are, you know, people in Greece, if you are, they, they don't have, you know, they don't work nine to five. They work nine to whenever the boss wants. But do you, okay, but do you actually, do you like to work? <laughs> Me or Greek people? You, do you like to work? I like to work, but my work uh, is not, I love my work. Like, you know, for me, uh, uh, my work is poly I see my work as politics and communication, and I do that all the time. I'm constantly talking, writing, doing anything, uh, all of that stuff. So for me, I have, I'm very lucky in that I knew from a very early age what I wanted to do. So I constantly feel like one whole person. I don't have to like check out in and out of work. Yeah. Okay. It also means I'm exhausted all the time, mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, I do, uh, and also I'm not, I'm not, I'm not particularly motivated by money, even though I probably should, but I'm not motivated by money. So, I, you know, I, I feel privileged when I do the things that I do. Like when I go on TV, I'm like, I'm like very happy that I get to like spread my propaganda. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Interesting. Because like I see, especially again, living where I live, I see how much like my family's mentality is transferred to me like i if i could have it my way i would not work i would just sit around all day what this, would you do though you you would need to do something right what well, would but you... i would like i would do what they do now i was like i'd go visit people go to the beach have a frappe smoke a cigarette really so you wouldn't uh, you wouldn't so if i could choose i would like to have more money so that i could be more comfortable that's one thing i would like especially with the housing situation in london i hate the stress mm -hmm of you know moving uh, every few years and not i, I hate that uh, and i would like to take more ubers uh, because i'm tired <laughs> but other than that um i don't i would still want to be doing the things i i, I would just want more money so that i can support this better like mm -hmm. wouldn't you wouldn't you want to write wouldn't you still want to write wouldn't you still want to i don't know have a profile of some sort like how, how sure. do you get your, I mean, your I'm status motivates you i'm exaggerating of course yeah. but yeah i mean in my mind though like the idea would be leisure just to like to enjoy enjoy life i don't know i mean but this I and mean, again like this is what my grandmother did like Thankfully, she had a husband who made enough money so she could live that kind of lifestyle. But I don't know. I mean, that's that's always my like. If if only I could just just chill, just hang around. No, but no, but so I mean, then I, I do want to ask you though. So like being in UK, I mean, there's a in London, there's a significant Greek population, from what I understand. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, like what? So from um, like I would say the first generation Greeks, so like children of immigrants. Greek immigrants in England what do you like what do you notice about them like what do you think they perhaps like what do they not understand about Greek culture like what is something that they miss out on not having actually grown up in Greece I don't really know a lot of people like that you really? know the, okay. the UK is not like uh, the US where you have a lot of second third generation immigrants no. I don't know a lot of Greek people here who uh, are people who are born like you like born to uh, with Greek, to Greek parents or grandparents. I don't yeah. really know. I know a lot of Greek people who arrived here like me. Okay. And a lot of them go back because they don't particularly enjoy the culture. A lot of them stay, obviously, as well. A lot of them stay. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the situation, the economic situation in the UK is no longer that great. It's not, it's not no longer a place where you come and you become, you know, you make good money and all of that. You need to really love this place to stay here. Like the only reason why I'm comfortably staying in London is because I'm so involved with British politics that, you know, it gives me yeah. life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, because in the US, and this is how it is with most like immigrant families, like the, the first generation tries to Americanize, they want to assimilate, they want to fit into the culture. Yeah. The second and third generation, like you see a lot of us trying to retrieve the cultural roots because once you're assimilated, like, it's like, okay, well, what, what are you then? Like, you don't, 
I feel like an American culture is so big and bland that it's hard to like have a solid identity. So then you want to go back to like what your particular roots are. That's my do experience. You feel, yeah. Do you feel close to your roots, to your Greek roots? Do you feel Greek at all? Well, the, th the difficult thing for me is that my father is not Greek. He's Italian. So uh, when I was around kids who like both of their parents were Greek, they made it very clear to me that I was not one of them. Because I don't speak fluently, like I speak basic, but like I can't, you know, have an hour long conversation and they would make me feel like, okay, you're not really Greek then. But then in school, there are kids who like, who did have like at least one Greek parent or grandparent and they like knew zero Greek. They never went to the church. They never did like Greek festivals. They never did anything. And I was like, oh, it's so like, they're not mm -hmm. me. So I was always in the middle. And as time has gone on, like, on one hand, I'm very grateful that I was raised with at least some of the culture, but then I'm sad. Like, I wish I could speak fluently. I wish I did go to Greece every single summer, like some of these other kids. Um, I wish I grew up in an enclave of mostly Greeks. Like when I, right now where I'm living in Brooklyn, like there are a lot of Greek people and I'm like, wow, why don't I grow up here? It's a different life. So it's, it's interesting being like somewhere in the middle, you know. I have one friend, very close friend, whose mother is Greek from an island, mm -hmm. and he looks and sounds completely British, like he's a red hair. Yeah. Uh, I was actually at his house yesterday with his mom. We had like a Greek Easter. It was Greek Easter yesterday. Um, and I always make fun of him because, you know, when he he speaks some broken Greek and he has a, a, a super English accent, then he just looks completely English. Yeah. You would never uh, guess. Um and I guess I can see it from his point of view that, like you, he does crave to have, you know, some kind of connection. Yeah. And I do think he is a more interesting person for the fact that he has this duality. Yeah. Uh, but I do think that, you know, I'm not sure the commitment is always worth it. I mean, I think mm -hmm. you are in a, in a privileged position where you can pick the good things from the culture and leave the bad things behind. And... I think that's the best course of action. Mm -hmm. So okay. there is definitely, you know, things that I don't like about Greek culture. So there is a certain, um, uh, what's the word, corruption, for example, that I don't like. I don't like, you know, our our more backwards attitudes towards women, and and these do exist as much as I enjoy, you know, the good the good bits that the bad bits exist as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, that challenges me to look at like the privileged position of being between two. Because I always thought like, oh, this is like you're neither, you're never one or the other. So like it's always you're always uh, somewhere outside. You know, you don't fit in. But it's interesting that you're like putting it in that lens. Like, and now that you bring up Easter, it's um, so like when where I grew up in Jersey, the church that we went to, the adults were like mostly immigrants you had some first generation and then you had the people my age who were either first or second and it still felt like a distinct cultural ambit like you felt like this was a greek space now in jersey and where my family is in new jersey like it's very suburban area it's the greek churches are very assimilated like most of the the, the services are in english but also the way people act like they're not acting like greeks like they're acting like like anglos and like I hate personally, I hate going to church in New Jersey because it's so boring. Like you feel like mm -hmm. a regular, like I don't know, like American Protestant church. Whereas like for Good Friday, I always go to to church in in Astoria, Queens, which is like the biggest Greek enclave in the U.S. You feel like you're in Greece. Like the the way that every the way people carry themselves, the way the church services, like you, I really feel like it's, it's like when I'm in Italy. Good Friday is my favorite day. Yeah. It, yeah, no, I, I love it. I love it. And, and I would hate it if it was in English. Oh my god! Exactly. I, exactly. I, only Kim where I are my swing, my sweet springtime. The if, yeah. if that was in English, I would hate it. Really? Um, yeah, in London we also have some ter Greek churches that are in English and some that are in Greek. And if I have a choice, I would go to the Greek one. Yeah, so that's why, like, on Good Friday, I can't compromise. I'm not going to go to New Jersey. I'm going to like the real Greek one. For Easter, we went. Yeah, yeah, Easter was, you know. It's nice to be with my family, but like it's it's boring. It's like you know, but anyway. So wait, so when they sing the Christos Anesti Eknekron, how do they sing it? How, how in, so in New good? Jersey, like they you know because we do three times first in Greek, the second oh. in English, then we'll do it in Greek again. And the English, like they always change the words because they never 
agree on the translation. I'm fine, yeah. You're saying, but yeah, no, it's it's yeah, that, but that's why I prefer to go like in the Greek neighborhood because it's you can you you can take it as seriously when it's in the like assimilated kind of suburbs. It's uh, I don't know, that, that's just my thing, but. But no, okay, so I do want to ask you, though, so I, as I said, like, I discovered you through this post on Mary Harrington Substack, where you talk about, like, you acknowledge that, sure, like, feminism in the West, like, it's gone too far in many ways, but a lot of people forget that in many countries, like, there's still a really messed up attitude towards women. Women don't have a lot of rights, so... No. My point is not that feminism has gone too far, right? That would be like saying, oh, anti-racism has gone too far. Yeah. We need to become a bit racist again. Yeah. No. Okay. Like, That's oh, you know, uh, uh, Black Lives Matter as an organization was corrupted. Then we found out about that scandal, which means that we were right. Racism has gone too far. Like, let's yeah. roll, roll back. No. <laughs> so yeah. I'm not saying that exactly with feminism. What, I'm, what I believe is that some people have co-opted feminism and they have... Um, uh, used it for um, selfish reasons okay. that in the name of feminism people have acted badly and they have called it feminism basically yeah. okay. and I do think there are examples of that in Me Too where not all but there are some women who have weaponized their femininity to bang other people in the head and say you stop talking because I'm a woman and mm -hmm. demand more promotions and more resources for themselves because they are women and these are not, there are a lot of, and there are still a lot of spaces where, you know, this is incredibly needed, but there are other places where, you know, uh, women, there, there are women who are already incredibly privileged and they have used this as an excuse to beat out their male competition. Uh, but all of that, when you're looking at the whole world, it's a tiny, tiny proportion of the female population of the world. Yeah. It's a tiny, tiny, there are, there are very, very, very few places where you can go and say, you know, feminists are really have too much power here or whatever, which is, again, not everyone. I think um, I think feminism is, you know, something that everyone should aspire to. I think feminism is a good thing. Um, so with with there is this there was this there has been this backlash to feminism, which was specifically to, you know, the third wave feminism and to, fem and to queer feminism more than that, really. And there were a lot of parts to it that people rejected. One of them was um, rejecting that the sexual revolution, which is you know what Louise Perry argues in her book, that the sexual revolution was a good thing for women, saying that it was actually in many ways quite a bad thing, because when you have uh, women being uh, able to take the pill and not get pregnant, what it does is it releases men from the responsibility of having to get married and to have kids. And a very pragmatic and uh, uh, view, uh, the evolutionary psychology view of, of, of sexual relationships is that most men, most men are pretty high in social sexuality, which means if they had it their way, they could rather have sex with loads of women, never settle, never get married, uh, just, you know, live this free love uh, 70s style uh, of, of dating. And so this is what Mary uh, Carrington would also say that, you know, you have, I mean, Mary Carrington says loads of things is a very, you know, she's an academic, she writes uh, all of the time. I could not summarize all of the things she says, but one thing she does say, which she will agree with Louis Perry, which, you know, uh, there was a lot of bad cultural, uh, in uh, a lot of bad cultural um, changes that took place yeah. after the sexual revolution. Mm -hmm. And so women should reject casual sex, should stop, should reject the pill, they should reject this kind of culture, and they should focus more on going back to, you know, getting married and having kids, because this is something that's a lot more helpful and fruitful for women, because if you want to have kids, the reality is you are far more secure doing that in the confines of marriage. Mm -hmm. And what they say is they look at, the, uh, at, at society as it is right now, and they will say... Um, we don't value marriage enough, we don't value family enough, and women are being hurt by it. Mm -hmm. And when I came to London, and if I look at my British, a lot of my British female friends in London, not a, like, uh, yeah, a lot of them, especially those who work, who are in London and they work corporate jobs that are very, very busy and they have enough money to, to feel, you know, financially secure in the future, there are, you can definitely make the case that there are some women who don't really value marriage, who don't value family enough, who don't particularly 
we may want to have kids, but they're not particularly concerned about marriage and all of that. So for them, I'm thinking, yeah, you know what? There are a lot of people for whom it is a good advice to tell them, you know what? Casual sex is not all it's cracked up to be. Casual dating is not all it's cracked up to be. Uh, uh, instantaneous head hedonism doesn't link, link to long-term satisfaction and security and happiness. But then I go back to Greece and I look at my at, at Greek women my age and we are still massively oppressed by patriarchy in Greece. We are still like uh, massively scolded if we are not married by the age of 30 and we haven't had our first kid by the age of 35 and all of that. We are, uh, our social position is so interlinked with our mating value and whether we manage to get married and to have mm-hmm. kids. And I see that for so many women, and, and it's not just women in the villages, you know, which there aren't that many because like every other country in, in Europe, Greece as well, we have you have massive urbanization yeah. uh, and and actually university education is extremely high, like 90 something percent of Greek students go to university. Um, what I see is that there are still loads of women whose values, is whose, the first thing you measure their value is, did you get married? To whom did you get married? Did you have kids? How old are you? Interesting. So, but I, I want to get into like you're saying that the excesses of feminist, the feminist movement in the West is not coming from feminism itself. It's coming from people who kind of deviated from the original ideal. I think right? it comes from personal character flaws. Yeah. Say more about those flaws, though. That's that's interesting. It's the same character flaws that made you know the the BLM movement like going um, uh, with uh, Black Lives Matter uh, misappropriating funds that were meant to be used to to actually, you know, to to fight racism or whatever. I think that, you know, you cannot, nobody can claim ownership of a specific, of, an, yeah. of an ideology, of a movement. Feminism is too big for any one person to say it is this thing or it is that thing. It is a movement that is going throughout centuries and it's going to continue to go because it will continue to have relevance for the lives of women. And I think that our biology is such that it will continue to have relevance. I do not know whether we will ever really, really live in a world where feminism will, will be inconsequential and unnecessary. Yeah. Um, so like if you apply what you're saying to the Me Too movement, broadly speaking, it's like, because I have to say, okay, men do not understand or don't know the things that women have to put up with in terms of abuse and uh, you know all these things unless a woman chooses to divulge to us and like i've kind of, over time i've come to learn like hey women have to put up with a lot of shit like mm-hmm. not all men obviously not all men are assholes but a lot of us are um and that's not cool like it's not fun to have to walk around worrying like is someone going to touch me is someone going to rape me is someone going to do something that you know is inappropriate so like that being said like i understand the need for a kind of mass response a mass reaction to the the status quo and then you see the excesses then you see like people being canceled for barely doing anything wrong um and then you see people who do something that's really fucked up and they still get away with it. And I'm like, yes, and, you know, and you see that in the UK as well. Yeah. So like, I'm left to wonder, it's like, I'm happy there's a response. I'm happy we don't just accept like, oh, you know, women, this is how it is. Men are men and women, this is what we do. But it does concern me that like, there are these mass, massive, um, you know, the fact that like, people get canceled for very dumb reasons. People's lives are destroyed. So like, no, I'm not going to come and say like, we should get rid of me too. But what do we say to that? Like, is it, should we just say like these, the people who go to an extreme need to be corrected? Do do we need to reconsider the way the movement is structured? Like, how do you respond to these kinds of things? I think you definitely need to call out things from within your own movement when you see them and you don't like them. And I've tried to do that in British politics when I've seen that, you know, politicians have been, attempt, people have attempted to cancel politicians with spurious reasons. Yeah. Uh, and people have been exonerated that have said, right, if someone has been exonerated, then, you know, we need to actually allow them to continue their life and their career. And you need to, like, lay your hands off them because otherwise people will stop trusting the process. Uh, having said that, I think that very often in politics, we always want to have an opinion on something and we always want to explain everything. And we always want to have this. We are really, really stuck to this fantasy that everything has a reason. Everything is, has a justification and we just have to dig and find it. And if we find it, then we can solve it. Sometimes things are just flukes. Sometimes things just happen because for, for no, like by accident or because of circumstances, by luck. Yeah. 
Like sometimes one person will just happen to have the right contact somewhere that will protect them, or some person will just happen to have enough uh, powers uh, come together against them, and it will just be their time. Like Harvey Weinstein, I don't think was the, the worst monster in Hollywood. I'm sure there were others. Yeah. It was literally just his time came. There were other reasons there. Like I have heard, you know, like the Red Scare podcast, uh, the Red Scared Girls, they, 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 make, they allude to the fact that, oh, you know, Harvey Weinstein was a victim because... Um, what was that they say? Because uh, basically he's, uh, he, he was become, I can't remember whether it was yeah. that he was becoming too successful. Like it was financial reasons, basically, that sure. they wanted to yeah. get rid of him, that people wanted to get rid of him. Mm. And I hear people say that, that some yeah. people are just targeted like that. I don't know. But he definitely deserved to go down, it seems like it. But. Yeah, yeah. I mean, part, there's a part of me that thinks like, I kind of see things in this fatalistic sense that like the pendulum is constantly swinging back and forth between extremes. So like, you know, in the past, it was okay that certain groups of people were treated like shit. It was okay that women could get, you know, treated horribly, that black people were enslaved. And now we go to this other extreme where like, yeah, people might be canceled for really dumb reasons. I'm kind of of the mind that like, this is inevitable. Like if there's always going to be excesses. There's always going to be flaws in whatever, you know, the status quo is. So when you have like reactionaries on the right being like, oh, we need to get rid of BLM. We need to get rid of me too. It's like, well, no, I mean, we're not going to have a perfect system. And I think what you're saying is like the most common sense thing. Like, okay, we need these movements when there are excesses, when it's going in the wrong direction, you call it out, especially who are like immersed in the movement. Like they need to be the ones to call it out. But I don't. I don't see an alternative. Like I don't. I don't know. And especially like. There's no alternative when you have masses of to have masses of people involved in something. You are going to have to accept that mistakes will be made. There is no other way. And this yeah. is how political movements have worked throughout history. But the other thing that I like this. I mean, all of this being said within the context of us living in a kind of globalized society. Because like, if we lived more, like if we go on back in the past and like focus more on like the local entity, the local communities. I think it's easier to deal with these situations with nuance when it's small scale. Oh, but yeah. that's not like local communities don't really have agency anymore. Now it's always but still the local communities burned witches and you know they did. They did. And feathered people. You know, it's sure. not like it's not like there was wisdom in local communities. And sometimes because when sometimes people can be extremely clu cruel to people who are close to them because that's, that's what the parties from hurts the mm -hmm. most. That's a good point. Yeah. Huh. It's no utopia. It's no utopia living in a local community, but I don't know. Um, so, okay, all this being said, what advice would you have to like people living in countries that haven't gone through these kinds of movements? Like, what would you warn them of? What do you, would you think they would should do differently from countries like the U.S. and the U.K.? Um, I think that uh, identity is not, you know, destiny, and I don't think that. I think that it's very important for people to not. To not use, uh, um, to not build their 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 self sense of self worth out of a political identity and a campaigning. Like the campaigning should be something that you do uh, without any ego, or at least you should try to do it without any ego. You should not try to use these opportunities to further your personal career and your your development in that sense. Because I think that that just leads to misery, and eventually you just feel like a clown. Eventually you stop start stop believing your own your own stuff. So I think that's the most important thing. But I think that people who don't live in the UK and the US very rarely have this uh, fear because um, they have very pragmatic, they have very real threats that yeah. they need to deal with. Okay. And when something is real, then people usually, you know, use their logic to yeah. solve it. Yeah, and I mean, just circling back, but this, this point you're making about identity I see it to be much more of an issue in cultures that are very, I use the word assimilated, but I, I think the better term would be like kind of globalized or pluralistic because there isn't a sense of like, you, you're you born into a culture that already has roots, that has a set of traditions and values and beliefs. So like, this is why for me, I do have, I do envy people who, you know, are super Greek, who are rooted in the culture because like, without that, what do I have? I understand why people cling to all these identities because like we need something to hold on to. We need something to give our who we are substance. So like, 
I think that's part of why in the US, the UK, we see a lot more of this identity stuff, but. Well, yeah, it's interesting because you say that and I'm thinking, okay, but what if you are just American? Well, what is that? What is just a lot of people who say, oh, then you're going to become, that's why you're going to be a queer, feminist, whatever, like you will have a political identity because you're trying to get a sort of ident sense of identity from that. But that's, this is the difficult thing, though. like, what is just American? Like, mm -hmm. most people would say, like, uh, like a redneck, like, those are just Americans, like people in the South who are, like, you know, working class. And the thing is, the, the difficulty with America is that it's so big, like, there are so many different types of cultures throughout the US. So like, in a way, rednecks, like, sure, they may espouse deplorable views, but like, I respect that they do have a culture of their own, like, they do have some sense of identity. And it's, it's coming from the fact that, like, there are certain traditions and values that are passed on to them. But like, living in a cosmopolitan area, like, again, being in the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area, if you don't have an ethnic identity, it's very hard to say, like, this is who I am. And that's why, again, like, I see a lot of my friends, people my age who cling on, who, like, invent an identity that they found on the internet. And, like, again, I I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's a solution, per se, but, like, I'm not mad at them. I totally get why they want to invent and cling on to some identity, because we need it, you know? Yeah. I don't know. That's, that's what I see. But... I, I think what you're saying that ultimately, like for countries, you know, outside of the, you know, US, UK, like identity by itself is not a solid enough basis to kind of build these movements. And like, I don't know, like, like you, when, the fact that you looked at Palia as somebody, you know, who sets an example, it's like, I think for her, yeah, like she very much wants women to have rights and opportunities, but she understands that like what it means to be a woman, like it's, it's not just, something ethereal like it's it's uh i don't know i feel like it's this also okay with messy uh yes. concepts like beauty yeah which uh, i like yeah. it would tell, say something about that eh? what, what it would say something about the her her way of talking about beauty that you like well i really i like how she's not afraid to say things that she doesn't just say things that will offend people that's what people find you know People think that it's difficult to offend people. No, everyone is offending everyone. Like, that's fine. Even politically correct people can offend others and they do it all the time. They just offend the groups that they are okay with offending. What's really difficult to do, especially as a woman, and Camille Pallier does it a lot, is hurt people. She hurts their feelings. Mm -hmm. And this is something that um, nobody, like, people really struggle hurt people's feelings like you can be a, you can call someone an asshole but it takes a certain kind of bravery to like you know be unkind interesting and yeah i feel like okay like us uk we have a certain sense of like a woman being maternal meaning like you're very nice and patient and kind and like when i think of my family like Women who are very maternal, very nurturing, that doesn't mean they're nice and sensitive. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they will tell you you're an asshole or you're an idiot or they'll beat you. I never was. But, you know, it's like... I guess My she... mom beat me. Oh. She, and she was very maternal as well. But that's that's the thing. It's like but, I yeah. see the cultural, different cultural paradigms, what it means to be maternal. Like, yeah, for, for Southern Europeans, for Mediterraneans, like being being harsh, being bold, blunt, like that doesn't mean you're not maternal. It's there's something else that I don't know. So yeah, the cultural differences again are interesting. But anyway, okay, so we covered a lot of ground today. Uh, for people who want to read more of your work, there's your Substack, of course. Um, anything else that you want to plug? Anything you want to direct listeners to? Uh, yeah, my Substack, the human carbohydrate, has everything they they would need, and you can find my Instagram there as well, which is under my name and my Twitter. I post a lot of stuff on my Instagram as well. Um, I will often post my you know political commentary as well. Uh, but yeah, thank you, Stephen. I really enjoyed this. Thank you, and no, it was great. Mm -hmm. yeah.